process of saying that uh, I'm going to talk tonight about science and technology policy in the first four years of the Obama administration. I'm not going to talk about anything uh, going forward because that is uh, proscribed uh, under law. As in my current position, I'm not allowed to talk about anything related uh, to, the, uh, to the campaign or the election or, uh, or a possible future. So forgive me for that. Um, but I'm going to start with President Obama's inauguration on January 20th, 2009, where he said, we will restore science to its rightful place. I'm going to talk a bit about what he meant by that and what he and we have tried to do uh, in order to do that in the Obama administration. I want to talk first about the place of science on the national agenda. And uh, a crucial part of that is the way that science and technology relate to all of the major challenges, virtually all of the major challenges that we face uh, as a society and that the world faces as a global society. Uh, economic development and sustainable growth, biomedicine, healthcare delivery, uh, the energy issue, how do we get the clean, safe, and reliable and affordable energy uh, that we need and that everybody needs, climate change mitigation and adaptation, uh, the intensifying competition for land and water around the planet, land and water for infrastructure, for housing, for growing food, for fiber, for chemical feedstock, uh, land and water for ecosystem function. The health and productivity of the oceans, an enormous challenge of interest to all nations, national and homeland security. None of these problems can be understood, never mind successfully addressed, without major contributions from science and technology. And yet, equally important, as the president mentioned in his address to the National Academy of Sciences just a few months after being inaugurated, is the role of science and discovery in what it means to be a human being, the role of science and discovery in lifting the human spirit. All of those are important. The place of science in the White House. Science uh, is centered in the White House in the office that I direct, the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, but we interact very closely with lots of other units of the executive office of the president. Uh, we interact closely with the Office of Management and Budget, the Council on Environmental Quality, the Council of Economic Advisors, the Domestic Policy Council. Domestic Policy Council has overall responsibility for health, for uh, education, among other things. And so in the domains of science, technology, engineering, and math education, in the domain of uh, health issues, we work very closely uh, with the Domestic Policy Council. Uh, we work uh, closely with the National Economic Council, particularly on innovation issues, advanced manufacturing, the connection of science and technology with the economy. And of course, we work closely with the National Security Council on the connections between science and technology and national and homeland security. There are really three dimensions of uh, OSDP's responsibilities. Uh, Harvey Brooks, one of the founding members, if you were, of the formal study of science, technology, and public policy, noted that one can distinguish between science and technology for policy and policy for science and technology. In the first category, science and technology for policy is making sure that the president gets the timely, independent, and, and objective advice that he needs about the science and technology dimensions of the issues that are on his plate. Policy for science and technology, on the other hand, includes, for example, the development of the science and technology budget of all of the federal departments and agencies that have missions in that domain. And that involves analysis, recommendations, and coordination, not only with the other White House offices that have to do with these matters, and particularly the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, but it involves lots of coordination with the departments and agencies themselves, with NSF, with NASA, with the Department of Energy, with the Department of Defense, with the National Science Foundation, with NOAA, uh, with NIST, with the U.S. Geological Survey, and more. Uh, we spend a lot of time on that. No sooner do you finish the president's budget for one year, and by the way, that process culminates with a meeting in which the president meets with the director of OMB and with me and with his chief of staff and makes the final decision on what he's going to do with whatever flexibility remains to him in the budget at that point, how much of it is going to go for science and technology, how much of it is going to go for health care, how much for education, and so on. Other aspects of policy for science and technology uh, include working on STEM education and workforce issues, 
uh, interagency science and technology initiatives, initiatives like the U.S. Global Change Research Program or the National Nanotechnology Initiative that cross departmental boundaries, uh, open government, broadband, scientific integrity, those are all in our domain of responsibility under the heading of policy for science and technology. And a third dimension of our work is thinking about how the mechanisms and processes of science and technology policy and government actually work, how they can be made to work better, where the defects are and how they can be repaired. Our specific responsibilities also include providing White House liaison and oversight for the National Science Foundation and NASA, which are two very important science-centered agencies which do not sit in cabinet departments. They have no cabinet secretary above them, so in essence they report to the White House through OSTP. The NSF reports to our Associate Director for Science, and our recent Associate Director for Science, Dr. Carl Weinman, is sitting there in the second row. Hi, Carl. Nice to see you. Uh, the uh, responsibility for carrying out a range of functions in support of national security and emergency preparedness communications is in our domain, and coordinating and overseeing U.S. cooperation in science and technology with other countries is in uh, our domain. The structure of this operation uh, is a little elaborate for an operation of about 100 people, uh, but we have uh, four major divisions, science, technology, environment and energy, and national security and international affairs, uh, and the usual array of uh, deputies, senior advisors, general counsel, and so on. Our budget's around generally $6 million a year, although it's a little less at the moment because we were um, penalized a bit uh, by our appropriators uh, over some disagreements we had with them about, uh, about priorities. But we'll be back to about $6 million a year, we hope, uh, going forward. Uh, we manage the National Science and Technology Council. That's a body that consists of the deputy secretaries and undersecretaries of the cabinet departments and agencies with science and technology missions. Uh, I chair it on behalf of the president. It has five standing committees. Four of them correspond to the divisions of OSTP. The fifth one is a standing committee on science, technology, engineering, and math education. And it coordinates science and technology activities that cross agency boundaries. Uh, I mentioned a couple of those already, the USGCRP, the National Climate Assessment is another one, the Networking and Information Technology R&D program is another. Some of these are very large, much larger than OSDP itself. Uh, the USGCRP is about two and a half billion dollars, uh, for example and it is run uh, and overseen by the NSTC under uh, OSTP oversight. Uh, we co-chair the National Oceans Council together uh, with the Council on Environmental Quality, which is responsible for implementing the national policy on the ocean, the coasts, and the Great Lakes. Uh, and we co-chair the Emerging Technologies Interagency Coordinating Committee, which is uh, looking at the interaction of science and regulation around emerging technology areas like infotech, biotech, and nanotech. Um, we co-chair, I co-chair with the science ministers of Brazil, China, India, Japan, Korea, and Russia, six separate ministerial level joint commissions on science and technology cooperation, which meet regularly and which are responsible for overseeing all the science and technology cooperation uh, between the United States and these countries. Uh, I also chair the Science and Technology Working Group of the U.S.-Russia Presidential Commission, which has uh, focuses on climate change, on information technology for open government, and on, uh, on nanotechnology. Uh, and finally, I co-chair with the Chinese Minister of Science and Technology something called the U.S.-China Dialogue on Innovation Policy, which is focused, among other things, on uh, helping the Chinese decide that some of the policies they've implemented under the heading of indigenous innovation are in fact not helpful either to China or its international partners. Uh, that's a picture of, the, uh, of a meeting of the Innovation Dialogue in China. Uh, they provide fancier centerpieces than we do uh, <laughs> when we meet in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, we also manage at OSDP the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. In the old days, this was called the President's Science Advisory Committee, PSAC. 
Uh, since the senior Bush administration, it's been called the Council of Advisors on Science and Technology to make sure that technology is in there alongside science. It has 21 members, 20 of whom keep their day job. Uh, I'm one of the co-chairs. The other co-chair is Dr. Eric Lander, who is the director of the MIT Harvard Broad Institute on Genomics. Uh, but the PCAST is another mechanism for providing the president access to high caliber science and technology advice more broadly based and reaching out into the wider community, the university community, the national lab community, the philanthropic community, and the corporate community. All are represented among uh, the members of PCAT. Uh, support for that is provided within OSTP by an executive director and a couple of deputies. Uh, these are the current members of PCAST. Uh, there will be a test right afterwards as to how many uh, you are able to recognize. Give you a nice long look here. Under uh, President Obama, we have restored the number of divisions in OSTP to the statutory four. In the previous administration, uh, there was only a science division and a technology division, and environment and national security were subsumed within those. Uh, we have doubled the size of the technical staff. Uh, the uh, rank of assistant to the president was one my predecessor, unfortunately, did not hold, which reduced uh, his access to the president. And uh, part of what this president meant when he said in his inauguration speech that he was going to restore science to its rightful place is he was going to restore his science advisor to the rank of assistant uh, to the president, which is a direct report. Um, he also uh, appointed a chief technology officer for the first time. Uh, the first time the United States uh, executive branch has had a chief technology officer. Uh, and that individual sits in OSTP and is supported by a team in our technology division. Uh, we have revitalized and expanded the National Science and Technology Council. PCAST has become more active and more relevant. And I'll illustrate that by listing the 14 studies that PCAST has completed for the president uh, up until now. Uh, these 14 studies have, were all requested by the president on topics on which he wanted uh, thorough, broad-based, uh, deep advice. They're all posted on the uh, PCAST website, uh, which is uh, a tab under www.ostp.gov, the OSTP website. You can go there, look under reports, uh, and you can find the full text of, uh, of all of the uh, PCAST reports, including one we released just this past uh, Tuesday on accelerating drug development and approval. Uh, the president actually reads these reports. Uh, he is amazingly interested in science and technology. Uh, he uh, regularly violates the rule that you shouldn't give a president a memo longer than two pages on anything. Uh, we give this president lots of memos longer than two pages and we have lots of evidence that he reads them and digests everything uh, in them. He has, in fact, embraced a high proportion of the recommendations that PCAST has made in those reports. A number of the recommendations that he has embraced uh, are, listed, are listed here, and this is an incomplete list. In fact, everything I'm saying is incomplete because there's not enough time uh, in a talk of this length to cover uh, all the domains uh, in science, technology, and innovation and STEM education in which uh, we've been working. But uh, the striking thing is how much attention the president has paid uh, to his PCAST. Uh, other things that he's done to restore science to its rightful place, I would start with the presidential appointments. He appointed five Nobel laureates in science to uh, presidentially appointed uh, positions. Uh, and um, I've listed them here. Another 25-plus uh, members of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, Institute of Medicine, and American Academy of Arts and Sciences are in presidentially appointed positions in this administration, including the heads of the NIH, NOAA, USGS, the Food and Drug Administration, and initially the National Institute for Food and Agriculture. I mentioned that he appointed uh, for the first time a CTO, and I didn't mention also a chief information officer uh, in the White House. And of course, he has a chemical engineer running EPA in Lisa Jackson. Uh, he's done a lot with the bully pulpit, the, the, uh, the podium of the presidency. 
in the attention he has paid to science and technology in his major speeches. And again, I list some of them here, by no means all of the major speeches in which the president has given major emphasis uh, to science, technology, innovation, the role they play in our society, in our civilization, and in addressing the challenges we face. Uh, this is the president at the National Academy of Sciences uh, just a couple of months uh, after his inauguration. He was the first president since JFK to go to the Academy's annual meeting uh, at his first opportunity since his inauguration to talk about his views about science, technology, uh, and, uh, and human well-being, if you will. Uh, we've also uh, had a lot of success with presidential events around uh, science and technology. You know, there's a sort of a competition in the West Wing among the various assistants to the president about our batting averages, what fraction of the events you propose to the president he actually ends up doing. Because, of course, there are far more things proposed to the president than he has time to do. In fact, his scheduler reported not long ago that among the roughly 10 assistants to the president, there are approximately 20 proposals per day for things that he, that he should do. Obviously, he's only going to accept a fraction of these. I continue to believe that OSTP has the best batting average in the White House uh, because he loves to do things around science and technology. Uh, every year, he uh, invariably makes the presentations of the National Medals of Science and the Medals of Technology, uh, technology and Innovation. Uh, he makes the presentations uh, himself for the Presidential Early Career Awards in Science and Engineering. He talks to the awardees. He uh, talks to the winners of the, uh, of the, of the teaching awards. Uh, he has the, the new Nobel uh, laureates, the new American Nobel laureates in the Oval Office every time. I think he's had seven astronaut crews when they return from their missions in the Oval Office. We had this great astronomy night for kids on the South Lawn <coughs> where the president, the first lady, and the first daughters came out and spent two hours with 300 kids. I'm going to have to get a drink of water here. <coughs> with uh, 300 kids from local middle schools looking through 16 telescopes, meeting with six astronauts, looking at moon rocks, and generally getting inspired about the excitement of science. Uh, science fairs, we've had two White House science fairs. <clears throat> the first one, the president was scheduled to spend 15 minutes with the assembled 20-some winners of national science and engineering competitions at the, largely at the high school level, a few middle school. Uh, he simply couldn't be pried out of there while the cabinet secretaries and the parents and the mentors and the teachers cooled their heels in the East Room, the president spent nearly an hour uh, crawling around on the floor with the robots, firing the marshmallow cannon, uh, and doing uh, <clears throat> and talking to the kids about what they were uh, what they were up to. Uh, <clears throat> he famously said at this science fair he dropped in on in New York. Whenever he gets a chance to go, he does. The American Innovation Strategy is something uh, that the administration launched early in the administration, relatively early September. 2009 with uh, three big pieces and a set of cross-cutting elements. Uh, the first part was recognition that we have to invest in the building block of innovation, in the advances in fundamental science and in our STEM education system and in the infrastructure uh, that science and technology depend on. Uh, Market-based innovation, a variety of ingredients recognizing <clears throat> that you have to create a, an environment of policy and economic conditions that are favorable to entrepreneurship, and some of the ingredients of that are listed here. The third part was looking for breakthroughs in specific areas of national priority, energy, biotech, nanotech, advanced manufacturing, space applications, healthcare, and of course, educational technology. Some of the cross-cutting elements were a focus on scientists and engineers early in their careers, more engagement of girls and women in STEM fields, doing better at commercializing university research, accelerating the pathway from discovery in university labs, 
into widespread application, and a focus on multidisciplinary and high-risk, high-return research. Public-private partnerships has been another big uh, focus of this administration in the science and technology domain, recognizing that firms fund about two-thirds of all the R&D that's done in this country. They perform more than two-thirds of it. Uh, we have been proposing since the beginning of the administration to make the research and experimentation tax credit permanent as part of the way to encourage that component of the national science and technology effort. The Congress hasn't let us do it yet, but we remain hopeful. The Recovery Act uh, helped start and grow clean energy businesses all across the country. The Small Business Innovation uh, Research Initiative is something that funnels money from diverse agencies to many uh, avenues of innovation. Small Business Lending Bill is all about loans and cuts in taxes for entrepreneurs. The DOE's Energy Innovation Hubs are great examples of how to link national labs, universities, and industry to bring together the comparative advantages of all of them. Uh, this, I like this picture of uh, the president seen through a turban at, uh, at GE Schenectady. Uh, in uh, January of last year, we launched something called Startup America, which is aimed, interestingly, at bolstering entrepreneurship by figuring out ways to increase the success rate of high-growth startups. And this includes mentoring of uh, beginning entrepreneurs, if you wish, by successful entrepreneurs to talk about what it takes uh, to succeed in these kinds of activities. Uh, the Wireless Innovation and Infrastructure Initiative uh, aimed again at a crucial part of that infrastructure on which our science and technology enterprise depends. STEM education has been a big deal for this president. Uh, he's uh, absolutely convinced that lifting our game in science, technology, engineering, and math education is probably the single most important thing that we can do for the future of the country. That has involved increased collaboration uh, of the White House with the Department of Education, with NSF, HHS, DOD, DOE, NASA, and more. It includes new national goals. It included in the Recovery Act uh, a strong component of the Race to the Top initiative with preferences to states whose proposals in Race to the Top emphasized innovation in STEM education. It has included the Educate to Innovate program for K through 12 STEM education that has attracted more now than three quarters of a billion dollars in private sector and philanthropic support, change the equation, another initiative in that domain, which was uh, added uh, about a year later with uh, 100, uh, more than 100 high-tech CEOs pledging uh, resources to uh, work with teachers and classrooms to improve the STEM education uh, experience. Uh, we recently launched the STEM Master Teacher Corps with $100 million in, uh, in funding for the current fiscal year and aiming for a billion in the next fiscal year to reward and empower our best STEM teachers across the country. Uh, not listed here because there wasn't room on the graph is uh, an inventory that we've conducted for the first time of all of the STEM education programs across all of the agencies that engage in these activities to try to understand what there is, what overlaps there are, what gaps there are, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, how do we make this system of federal investments, which total about $3 billion in STEM education, uh, work better? Um, this is uh, the president with uh, uh, some of the teachers who won presidential awards for excellence in STEM teaching, uh, a bunch of uh, middle school mathletes, winners of a national math competition in the Oval Office, with the president. Initiatives in energy environment, I know a topic of interest to many of the folks uh, in this room and in this region. There was 80 billion for clean and efficient energy altogether in the Recovery Act, included there and in subsequent budgets funding for the new Advanced Research Project Agency in Energy, ARPA-E, six new energy innovation hubs I mentioned before, the first ever fuel economy CO2 combined tailpipe standard uh, for light duty vehicles, fuel economy standards uh, for trucks uh, are emerging. A new interagency task force to coordinate the government's activities in climate change adaptation, reinvigoration of the global change research program, of course the new national ocean policy and national ocean council, that's the president signing the executive order uh, for the national 
uh, Oceans Policy in July of 2010. Uh, Infotech and in innovation, big focus uh, with the help of a CTO and a CIO. Uh, open government, data.gov, uh, big data, an announcement just a couple of months ago of a new program on how to manage and manipulate large data sets. Of course, everybody in this room knows that the flow of data coming from so many different uh, areas, uh, from genomics, uh, from social networking, from the economic domain, from the space telescopes, uh, and many others. Uh, we, we really do uh, need to understand that modern computing is not just about big iron, as one of my colleagues says, but it's about big data and learning uh, what to do with information in these volumes. U.S. Ignite, uh, another one announced this year for facilitating uh, super high-speed broadband and new applications taking advantage of it. And just in the last uh, month or so, we've launched the first cohort of Presidential Innovation Fellows, which is just, a, I think, a terrific idea. I can say that because it wasn't my idea. But uh, <clears throat> we selected 18 people out of 700 applicants who agreed to drop their other activities and occupations and come to Washington to work full time for six months in teams on uh, five different information technology linked innovation challenges. And there'll be a series of these going forward. <clears throat> you can find out more about the Open Government Initiative uh, on its uh, webpage, open.gov. Uh, the uh, data initiatives are all described at data.gov with access to many databases that were never accessible before. A big deal and a big effort has been what I will call a course correction for NASA. The NASA we inherited uh, was suffering from a number of rather serious maladies. The Constellation Program for Human Space Exploration, which was devised in the previous administration but never had budgets adequate to the task, was hopelessly behind schedule and over budget at the time we inherited it. And NASA's other missions in science, technology, robotic missions to the planets, telescopes, Earth observation, aeronautics, and the International Space Station were all imperiled by the cost overruns occurring in the Constellation program. And we struggled with that problem and struggled with it in the context of an inability to raise the total budget by very much uh, and because of the financial constraints that the whole country was facing. And so what we did is we slimmed down and retargeted the Constellation program, canceled substantial pieces of it, kept the best ones, uh, emphasizing visits to a near-Earth asteroid, which is a new target for our human spaceflight program, and ultimately, of course, uh, Mars. Uh, <clears throat> developed programs to encourage the emergence of a commercial crew and cargo industry for carrying astronauts and crew to low Earth orbit. Extended the operation of the International Space Station. We'd spent with our partners, with our international partners, roughly $100 billion on the International Space Station, and yet it was scheduled to be flown into the ocean, uh, discarded in 2016, at the end of 2016, for lack of the money to continue to operate it. And oddly enough, a very expensive part of the Constellation program, which was designed to carry astronauts to the International Space Station, was not going to fly until 2017. Now that's what you call a dysfunctional program, when the place you're going is not going to be there anymore after the rocket that gets you there is finally ready. Uh, so we changed that and uh, committed ourselves to continue with our partners to run the International Space Station, which is, is a terrific platform for both science and technology development uh, to at least 2020. And we were able to restore uh, a lot of the support for programs that had been neglected or imperiled, uh, including the James Webb, which is now back on target, the successor to the Hubble, with capabilities in the range of 100 times greater. Uh, I brought a few pictures along of the space program because I find these are fabulous. This is the SpaceX Corporation's Dragon capsule docking with the International Space Station in May of 2012. This is the first time a commercial operation has docked a vehicle with the International Space Station. They launched it, they built it, they worked with NASA to dock it. It carried cargo to the space station and returned uh, cargo successfully to Earth. This is the Curiosity Mars Science Lab parachuting toward the Martian surface in uh, August of this year, a photograph taken from another Mars orbiter uh, 
that we have up there. And this is sort of a self-portrait of Curiosity, this 2,000-pound SUV-sized vehicle uh, on now sitting on the surface of Mars, completely intact. There were many things that could have gone wrong on that descent, but none of them did. Uh, I was at JPL uh, with the NASA administrator at the time, and I was so nervous I almost threw up. And, uh, and Charlie Bolden was kind enough to share that with the world in the press conference. <laughs> the press con conference was followed immediately. He introduced me. He said, here's the present, present science advisor, Dr. John Holden. He was so nervous he almost threw up. Uh, but it was true. Uh, this picture was just uh, made public by NASA today. This is an image taken by Curiosity, what appears to be an ancient stream bed on Mars, a kind of cementing of pebbles uh, that takes place in stream beds and the kind of uh, topology that looks like a stream bed. Uh, they've got a number of pictures of this sort that they just released today, which is considered to be the best evidence so far of flowing water uh, on the Martian surface. It's an indication of the kinds of science uh, that this extraordinary uh, mission is, uh, is going to be able to do. Uh, of course, everybody in Washington says, if you want to know what's happening, follow the money. I have to say a few things about budgets. There was, of course, this huge boost that I've already mentioned, a huge boost for science and technology, which totaled altogether $100 billion, about $18 billion for research uh, in the Recovery Act. The president in that National Academy speech, which I already mentioned, had a number of uh, rather visionary goals, a uh, goal of doubling the budget for three of the basic science agencies, uh, making the research and experimentation tax credit permit, permanent, lifting public and private investment in R&D to greater than or equal to 3% of GDP, a level it approach in the height of the space race that has never uh, matched since. His 2011 20 2010, 2011, 2012 budgets would have put us on track to meet those goals if the Congress had passed them. There were uh, setbacks in those appropriations, uh, in part most recently because of the Budget Control Act uh, spending cap. But in spite of those setbacks, in spite of them, science and technology fared better in both 2011 and 2012 appropriations than almost any other sector of government. Uh, and again, that happened because this president does uh, care about science and technology. The 2012 appropriations, uh, some of the key ones for science uh, are listed here. Uh, in 2013, the president's budget, again, uh, a mixed bag, not everything we would have wanted, but a lot better uh, for science and technology than almost anyone would have expected under the circumstances that we were struggling with in terms of the uh, of the overall cap. Uh, I want to close uh, talking about the challenges that we face in federal science and technology policy, both of a general nature and then of a more specific nature. Uh, the big challenge is in policy for science and technology. You remember this two-sided approach I talked about before. Allocating budget resources among competing needs is just a continuing challenge, even a continuing nightmare, uh, in part because you're comparing apples and oranges. Uh, how do you compare the needs of the health sector with the needs of uh, fundamental physics or space science or Earth observation? Uh, very difficult thing to do. Another big challenge uh, that we struggle with every day is how to reconcile, or if we can't reconcile them, then tolerate the diversity of agency perspectives that come from the diversity of their structures and their missions and their cultures on questions like transparency and openness, the roles of scientists in public communication, things of this matter are very hard. They're very hard to get right, but they're also very hard to get uniform uh, in a diverse set of uh, federal science and technology agencies. Uh, third huge challenge is, is fomenting and coordinating interagency initiatives. That gets particularly hard in tight budget times, because in tight budget times, every agency wants to protect its very own stuff before it protects its interactive ventures with other departments. Uh, science and technology for policy. Of course, a key challenge is recognizing that the science and technology facts aren't everything. That is, that the decision makers who in the end have to choose are taking into account values, they're taking into account economics, they're taking into account social policy. What scientific integrity requires, and I think this is often uh, misunderstood, is that the scientific facts always be present at the table and be known to the decision maker. 
the scientific facts as best we can present them. And that means together with the uncertainties that surround them. But it doesn't mean that those scientific facts will always govern the outcome. People are always coming to me and saying, how can you say you care about scientific integrity when this decision was made that didn't comport with my understanding of the scientific facts? Well, that that decision was made does not necessarily mean the scientific facts were not known to the decision maker. It means something else trumped them. Uh, and that's a reality of politics. And if you're going to work in this field, you've got to recognize it. Uh, another crucial thing is cultivating cooperative relations with other advisors. That is, the science and technology folks are not the only folks advising the President of the United States. And it's a whole lot better if you're working in cooperation with those other advisors with the chair of the National Economic Council, with the chair of the CEQ, with the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, with the chair of the Domestic Policy Council. Because if you're in partnership, you're in a lot stronger position than if you're fighting. And in fact, uh, this president's message is, we can't afford to be fighting. We need to be working together. That doesn't mean you have to start out agreeing. You need to work through disagreements which are inevitable. But continuing to fight uh, is generally a bad practice in government. You need to arrive at a satisfactory compromise and move forward, and you need to move forward cooperatively. Another big challenge in science and technology for policy is just figuring out how, you, how to use the time and the attention of the principal wisely. It's almost unimaginable what the pressures are on a president of the United States, any president, the number of issues that the president has to be on top of, has to address, has, has to make decisions about. Uh, you know, everybody relishes the possibility of time with the president, face time with the president. That's a very valuable currency. But you better not squander that currency when you have it, because if you overuse it, you won't have it for long. That's a big, a big lesson from this environment. Let me talk about the specific challenges that are ahead uh, for us in this domain. Now, obviously, a huge one is sustaining support for science and technology under budget cuts. Uh, we all hope that the sequester will not happen, that Congress will come to its senses and craft a balanced deficit reduction plan, which has always been intended. It was never intended that the sequester, which is scheduled to take place at the beginning of 2013, should actually happen. It was in intended as a sword of Damocles, which would hang over the Congress and force them to produce a reasonable deficit reduction plan. They haven't done it yet. Uh, they still could do it. Um, and they need to do it, because uh, if the sequester happens, it's going to be devastating for science and technology, as well as for many other domains in which government investments are absolutely crucial. Uh, within the science and technology domain, there are some things that are always particularly hard uh, to, do, uh, to do well and to do uh, in concert with the Congress. In the NASA domain, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope and Advanced Technology are two of the domains that fall in that category. James Webb has some very strong supporters in Congress, some very influential supporters, but it's an expensive operation. There are other folks in Congress who think there are other things that could be done with the money. Uh, advanced Technology has suffered at NASA for a long time uh, with basically very large investments being made to carry out the current missions and not enough investments being made in the advanced technologies that will be need, needed for future missions. I mean, the plain fact is we don't have the technology yet to go to Mars. You know, everybody talks about how important the goal is of having Mars out there as a place we're ultimately going to send astronauts. We don't have the technology to do that. We don't have the technology to protect our astronauts from radiation in outer space for the length of time that it would take us to get to Mars with current propulsion technology. We need some combination of better propulsion technologies and better radiation protection before we can do that. And we just haven't been investing enough in it. But it's been hard to get the money to do that in the face of the cost of current missions. Uh, in NOAA, polar orbiting satellites, absolutely crucial for our weather forecasting and for our climate studies. The constellation of polar orbiting satellites is in some disarray. We are faced with the threat of a major gap in our capacity to forecast weather more than two days ahead. And, uh, and these satellites are expensive. And uh, it's been a very difficult uh, struggle uh, getting agreement on the budget uh, that are needed to minimize that gap. It's almost certain that we're going to have a gap, but we need to minimize it. 
uh, the notion of, of climate of a climate service, uh, analogous in a way to the weather service, something that's very attractive uh, to many of us. Uh, our citizens, our business people, our farmers are going to need more information as the climate continues to change. They're going to need more information to be able to take the adaptive actions that are possible in principle. We're going to need something like a climate service, but in the current Congress, that's a very hard sell because a lot of folks in the current Congress don't seem to believe that the climate is changing. DOE, very expensive uh, activities that are important but hard to fund at the required level. Uh, capture of carbon dioxide so it can be sequestered uh, away from the atmosphere uh, when we use fossil fuels. Uh, the fusion effort. Uh, we've been spending money on fusion for 50 years, really 60 now. It doesn't work yet. Uh, we're getting closer. We don't have enough long-term options, uh, in my view, to throw this one away. But it's very expensive, and Congress is asking, not too surprisingly, how long do we have, have to keep putting money in this until we get a kilowatt hour out? Uh, tough sell. Uh, at the National Science Foundation, er every couple of years, uh, some faction in the Congress attacks the notion that social science is science, and we shouldn't be doing it at the National Science Foundation. And usually they produce, along with this argument, some titles of research projects that strike them as funny. Um, this is a long tradition in the Congress. But it's very dangerous. Uh, it, it, it seriously threatens uh, our capacity to support social science research, which is enormously important and enormously valuable. You can tell a great story about what social science research has done for us in this society in terms of our well-being. But that story is longer than an elevator speech. It's longer than a sound bite. And one of our great struggles, and I'll refer to this later, is getting crucial scientific messages across in a sound bite culture. Uh, USDA, the USDA wants to do more peer-reviewed agricultural science, and they need to do more. We face many challenges in the agricultural domain, not least the ones associated with continuing climate change, and yet the uh, powers that be and the forces that exist have made it quite difficult for the USDA to increase the amount of peer-reviewed uh, research that it supports. EPA and FDA, the Environmental Protection Administration, the Food and Drug Administration, both need uh, additional work on how we bring science most effectively to bear on the regulatory process. And yet, for all the squawking that is done uh, by many people about regulatory overreach and we have to have regulatory decisions be fact-based and so on. It's incredibly difficult to get the support uh, to do this work. Uh, the U.S. GCRP, uh, as I mentioned, it's about $2.5 billion a year. Uh, that's a lot of money, but it's not really enough in the face of the magnitude of the challenges that we and the rest of the world face in that domain. And the words climate science and sustainability science are still anathema uh, in, uh, in some parts of the Congress. That makes this a big challenge. Anything related to international cooperation is a challenge. I mean, there are a lot of folks, uh, again, uh, the folks who control the purse strings, who seem to believe that anything international is a boondoggle. Or they believe that any international cooperation is simply a hose through which we siphon out U.S technological advantage into the possession of our competitors. And again, there are very powerful answers to those assertions, but they take uh, more than a sound bite to relate. In fact, our cooperation in science and technology is often a pillar of the relations we have with other countries around the world. It's something they value the most about our interaction with us, and it's a very valuable leverage point in dealing with difficulties in our relationships in other respects. In addition, we choose our science and technology cooperation very carefully to be largely in domains that are either fundamental science, where we're building up basic capacities in other countries and building the global science community, or in domains that are win-wins. For example, we cooperate with the Chinese on influenza. Well, it turns out that part of the world is where most influenzas originate, and by cooperating with the Chinese, we get, among other things, months of extra notice in terms of what's emerging and coming our way that we can use to develop and produce and distribute vaccines. But anyway, it's a tough sell. NIH funding, interestingly, the National Institutes of Health, 
tends to be less contentious because the NIH focuses, among other things, on the diseases of middle-aged members of Congress. <laughs> but, uh, but it's still hard to increase because NIH funding is already so large. You know, their budget is about $31 billion a year. Uh, and that's bigger than NSF, NASA, and NOAA combined. In fact, you can throw NIST in there, too. Um, and so it is hard to increase, even, even though there's a widespread belief that that's worth doing. Uh, l l let me close with a few uh, particular additional challenges uh, that, we're, that we're working on. One is how to accelerate the translation of scientific and engineering advances into economic and social benefits. I mentioned already some of the ways we're trying to do that, in particular through closer public-private academic uh, partnership. Uh, second big challenge ahead clearly is advancing a coherent energy and climate policy. That's going to need increased public and private investments in both mitigation and adaptation. I often say in climate policy we have three choices, mitigation, adaptation, and suffering. And if you want to minimize suffering, and that should surely be the goal of our policy, then we need to do a lot of both mitigation and adaptation. And we're not there yet, remotely, in terms of what, what is happening. Uh, there are systemic weaknesses in our STEM education system. And I list uh, two of the biggest ones here. One is weak teacher competence at the K through 12 levels in the STEM field. And the other is inertia with respect to adopting more effective methods at the college level. Carl Wyman, who founded the uh, program in, in uh, STEM education, here and a similar program uh, at the University of British Columbia, was my deputy for science for, for a time, uh, has been a leader in pointing out that research has shown us methods that work much better in teaching uh, the STEM fields at, at the college level, particularly the first two years of college, and the ones that most people use, uh, that engage the students in, in questioning, in thinking about solving problems get them interested and inspired and excited about what science really is uh, before they get discouraged and bored and go into something else. But there's a huge amount of inertia uh, to change it in this domain. And we're working on that. We're working on the weak teacher competence. It's going to remain a huge challenge. And finally, I mentioned this challenge of getting key messages across. Those key messages include why science and engineering matter. The president understands that, but not all of our citizens do. Uh, why they matter to the economy, why they matter to the environment, why they matter to security. And the basic question of how science works. I mean, if you look at the things that are said about evolution or about climate change, uh, you realize that most people don't have a real understanding of how science works, of where credibility comes from in science, of what uncertainty means in science. People don't understand that scientists emphasize uncertainty in part because that's where the remaining questions are. That's what they'd like to learn how to reduce. Uh, many members of the public think that uncertainty means when we learn more, it'll be better. Uh, they don't understand that uncertainty cuts two ways, and they don't understand that uncertainty doesn't mean we know nothing. So we have big challenges uh, ahead. Uh, we think uh, on a lot of these, progress is being made, but uh, we're going to need a lot more. Thank you very much.